So before starting, uh, today you will spend three hours with me. In the first hour and the half, more or less, we will speak about uh, HTTP, REST, and JSON. And in the second uh, hour and something, we will speak about instead a use case in Python to build a REST server. But before that, I have a, um, a news we can say. On Monday, on Monday, that is the 24th of April, right? You have, uh, as you, usually, um, La Dispe in uh, six, six, 16, uh, 17, and 30, as usual. And then we have the lecture, 17, 30, 19, as usual. The not usual things is that it's not here but will be in room 1i, okay? So the lecture on Monday, just on Monday, will be in room 1i, not here, because we need, we, we will cover the Philips U, and so we'll bring the, the Philips U lamp, the Philips U bridge, and uh, uh, this system is not suitable for recording the screen and the Philips U bridge and so on, so we'll move in room 1i when there is the, that a students that we will record with the not self non the self registration system, but the real registration system of the Polytechnic with a person that uh, moved the, the camera and so on. So the, the news is Monday there is lecture, there is lesson, yes. In the first hour in the half in the Adispe, and the second hour in the, in, uh, in the half in the room one here, one high instead of here. Okay? So this is the the great news. So, today, in this first hour in the alpha, we continue to speak about uh, web. In particular, we will cover three things. The first one is the rest, the HTTP protocol. We will see something about the HTTP protocol, not much more than you need for this course. Then we'll move to the REST style, architectural style, that is based on the HTTP protocol. That is why we covered the HTTP protocol before. And then uh, I will give you a brief introduction to JSON, that is a data interchange format that is quite used uh, nowadays in the web for the APIs and so on. So the goal in this first hour is, first of all, under, understand the main communication protocol, the main feature of HTTP. And second, how to use REST architectural style to integrate remote service, that is to call existing RESTful, REST-based architecture, REST-based server, that is called also RESTful server, RESTful API and also offer in your own application, in, in your own prototype, uh, some RESTful services. Let's start from JSON. That is the last thing that I told you, but this first thing that we will cover. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object Notation. It is, by definition, on uh, its website, is a lightweight data, for data interchange format, easy to read and write for human, and easy to parse and generate for machine. This is the official definition. JSON is a subset, is related to JavaScript that we will um, tell you something during the next weeks, uh, and is a data interchange format. So a textual format made for exchanging information between client and server, between computers. Hmm? is one of the data interchange format that is almost standard 
end use in the world. JSON is a, as a logical structure that is quite simple and is built on two structures only. The first one is a collection and the other one is an array, a list. The collection is start with this parenthesis and end with this parenthesis, while the list, the array, start with the square parenthesis and end with the square parenthesis. This just structure can be combined together. You can have an array with inside a collection, with inside an array, with inside a collection, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. An array is a list ordered of values, one values for each element of the array. So an array has one values, comma, another, another values, comma, another value, and so on. A collection instead is, a, is the, an item in a collection is a pair of name and value. Hmm? These should uh, remind you two things in Python. What this in Python is a the same here. This is a yeah, a list, like in JSON. And this is not a collection in Python, we call it uh, we call it uh, dictionary. And we will see briefly now that uh, this is very important because Python is able to take a JSON and each time it found a collection, it automatically converts the collection in a dictionary and every time it found a list, uh, in this way it automatically transforms the list uh, in a list in Python. So every JSON collection will become a Python dictionary and every array in JSON will become a Python array, a Python list. So a JSON looks like this thing. You see, in this case we have a, a collection that start here and stop here. And inside the collection we have a key and a value. Then we have a comma and then another key and another value, and so on. You notice here that the name values, the pair name value, key value, could be of two types. String, that start with this double quote and end with double quote, like first name, John Smith, last name, address, and so on, and number, that doesn't start with uh, double quotes. In JSON, you have these three, you can say, data structure. String, words, number, and booleans, true and false. Every, everything else must return to one of these structures. So for example, a, a phone number here is a string, is represented with a string. So what do we have here? We have these two name values pair, this first name, colon, John, last name, Colin Smith. Then we have this comma to end the, the couple, the pair. Then we have this other key. And as a value, we have an entire new collection. Not a single value, but a collection, again. And this is perfectly valid in JSON. So we have a new collection that starts with this parenthesis and hence here, and inside, it's a collection. So we have an other pairs, key values, key values, key values, key values, with where this value is a number and not a string. Then here there is another comma because this was the value of the previous key. And here we have another key that is phone number. And here as a value, we have an array, an array of string in this case that is numbers, phone numbers, again separated with comma at the end of the line. So these are, this is what JSON look like. Could be much more bigger, uh, could, could be bigger, could be uh, with more child, but the basic structure is this. Collection, array, mixed together, and inside of each collection or each array could be a string, a boolean, true and false, or a number, nothing else. Hmm? The data structure that I tell you by voice is here represented. These are the two valid data structures. This is the 
a collection that is called the year object that inside could have a string, a colon, a value, a comma, another string, and so on, and I'll loop here forever. And an array that could be here a value and uh, um, separated by this comma. A string could be any Unicode character except uh, double quotes, because double quotes start a string, so you cannot have a string inside a string, and this other character. A value could be a string, a number, an object, that is, again, another, a collection, what I call it, a collection, an array. So here you can put an array, you can put a collection. Here you can put an array, you can put a collection, you can put a string, you can put a number. Here you can put only a string as a key in a collection. True, false, or null, hmm? this special value. A number is something that is formatted in this way. You could be a uh, minus if you want, there is some digit, uh, or a zero, uh, point, some other digits, and so on. So this is the representation of a number. And this is JSON. I would like to show you how to use JSON in Python. Um, Let me create a uh, mei.json file, and then let me edit this file, maybe. So let's start with uh, a collection here, an object, and inside we can put something like, uh, I don't know, name, colon, uh, ambient intelligence, then uh, uh, credits, six, well, yes. And um, uh, code, that is um, zero, one. Okay, so this is a JSON file. This is a village JSON file. So we can save this thing. Hopefully, I don't know where I'm writing this thing. Okay, and we can start here, Python. Yeah. So this is a file. In Python, we have basically um, to import the JSON module that is already included in the Python standard, uh, we can say library, that is import JSON, and then we can use the methods, the function uh, available from JSON. There are two, basically. One is called json.load that takes a JSON in a file or written here in this way, mm -hmm. written directly here. It's not practical, but mm -hmm. written here and so on. And give you the equivalent in, uh, um, in, in Python. So each collection, each object becomes a dictionary, uh, each, array, each array becomes a list. And uh, the uh, opposite, uh, that is dumps, that takes a dictionary, an array in Python, and give you the representation in JSON. So let's try with that file. So um, wait, let's, we need to open, first of all, that file that is called mei.json as file, uh, content equal json.load uh, file. And then we can say print content and then we can also say type of content, hmm? just to check that effectively is a dictionary and array what, what is. So if I print the content, you see that it's printed correctly, is, is what expected, is what is present in the file. And this 
is, is a type dictionary because here we have only a dictionary. So this content here, this variable content, hosts a Python dictionary. Then we can take this content with JSON dumps and recreate the string representation of that file. The, the JSON, the JSON string representation, text to representation. Okay. Then we will see um, how to uh, also use JSON in Flask. This is plain Python in your in application. So let's move to HTTP. So JSON is a data interchange format, plain text. You can write it with a notepad or something like that. Hmm? HTTP. HTTP, as you may know, um, stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol, where the, the other T is this one, uh, is the network protocol used to deliver all data over the web. Hmm? And for all data, it means HTML files, images, um, sound, audio file, videos, JSON file, and so on. Hmm? Well, HTTP takes place over TCP connection. It's not really important here. And it's, it's, it's important, but not for the purpose of, of this, uh, we can say, this course. And uh, is specified, is a standard specified in this uh, uh, RFC that is quite uh, simple and concise for uh, RFC, that is typically are more uh, complex, uh, long, and difficult to read. This one is quite simple and short to read. So if you want, you can also read the specification of the HTTP protocol. That is a simple protocol, a really simple protocol. So basically, the HTTP uh, protocol uh, happens between two entities, typically, what we call here a client and a server. The client starts the conversation by sending a message that is a request. And the server, if it's able, responds, reply to that request. So we have two messages in, in the HTML, HTTP protocol, a request and a response. And then if you need to uh, continue the conversation between the client and the server, you have another request and another response, another request, another response, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? HTTP messages are, as I told you, simple. Uh, HTTP message, be request, be response, no matter, are structured in this way. There is an initial line, always, that is composed by three uh, blocks, we can say. Then we have zero or more headers line that are composed in, in the in the pair key values. So there is a key that is the name of the header, colon, the value, new line, another header, colon, another value, etc., etc., etc. Then it could be a body of the message, of the request, of the response. It's optional. Not always is present. Sometimes it's present, sometimes not. If it's present, it's always started by a blank line here. So the basic structure, when the body is present, is initial line, series of header, one, two, three, 100, new line, blank line, and the message body that is here it is deeper than this. So this is an example of the requ of our request and a response. So we can notice some things. The first of all, the request is composed by three elements, this first one, this other, and the third here. And the response is composed again by three elements, the first, the second, the third. This is the initial line I told you before. In the request, the content this line is Composed by the first one is the HTTP verb or HTTP method that we want to uh, compose the request for. The second one in this case is the head. Head is a method for getting only the header of the of the response of a determinate uh, resource. Hmm? This index.html is the resource. 
this heat applied to this resin. And this is the protocol type and version. So we want to have HTTP version 1.1. We don't want to speak which HTTP 1.0, that is the previous version. And we don't want to speak with HTTP 2, that is the future version. And then the request has another header that is host that indicates the, the domain or the, the host name to which the request is directed. At this request, a response, this is the client, the server, will reply with something like this. We have in the initial line three items again. The first one is the protocol with the version, like before. And then we have a number and a string, we can say. This number and the string are uh, interconnected, we can say. Then the string is the uh, textual representation of the meaning of this number. This number is 200, it means uh, Okay, is a status code for the request. So the request that starts here, the response say, okay, I can comply with this request. And the status code is 200 and the content, the textual message of the status code is okay. Then we have other uh, headers like date, the current date that obviously is not 2005, the server, how it present, the, la the last time that that resource here, this index.html, has been modified, that is in this other date, and other properties, other headers. Notice that every header is start with a string, and then there is a column, a value, a new line, another header, and so on. And we, we can also see, to, to verify that it that I, is not false, we can also, for example, take the, our website and uh, here, the network, if we, no, let me, yeah. if I select th this first one, for example, yeah. the browser, you already know from Flask, from my lecture of some weeks ago, that when you type here an address, you send a GET request to that domain. So you send a request like this, but here you have GET instead of HEAD, and the response should be the header, and it has a body that is the HTML page from the server. So here we have, we can see that is the a request header, and we have, for example, that the host is didattica.polito.it because it's where the request goes. And uh, the, the language is typically Italian here in the request. I prefer, this browser prefer to have a reply in Italian. And the response, and you have here the request method that is get, the status code that is 200 okay, like in our example. And the response, again, as a series of header here, like date, that we, we see in the slide, that is the date of today, yeah, and so on. So this is for real what happens when you type something here. Uh, well, yeah, I already told this. Um, there are, these are all the HTTP method available or verb available. We, we see the head in the, in the example. The head request gets just the HTTP header of a domain, of a host name. Only the header, not the body content. A request could, be, could have a, a body and the response could have a body the header response, the header request, the header response doesn't have any body, neither, not one or the other. The get and the post, we already, you already encounter here with Flask, the get is what you, you obtain when you type something in your address bar in your browser, gets the HTTP head and body of a resource. So when you type didattica.polito.it, you send a get request 
and the response will be, for example, 200 OK, and as a body, all the uh, content of that uh, web page, so the HTML, the HTML, the CSS, and whatever. The get request doesn't have a body. The get response typically has a body because it's the response of the content that you required for that resource, the representation of the resource in a browser and HTML file. Post is a method to submit data to a server. The post request as uh, a body, that is the data you want to submit, uh, you want to send to the server, while the re response typically doesn't have any uh, body. Mm. Uh, the browser, browsers are able to perform these three operations. All the other, a browser by itself, like Chrome, like Firefox, is not able to perform this without any, we can say, external help like Ajax or server-side implementation. A browser gives mainly get and post. Where do you, do you encounter the, po where do you encounter, the, use the post here in this course? In which, uh, in which occasion do you use the post or request? <laughs> yeah, for sending text box when you perform the login <laughs> operation with Professor Corner, you send login, login data, username and password, typically, in a post, in a request. At the body of that request is the content of your username and password. Then the other methods, we will... Uh, we will concentrate mainly on put and delete. Put is similar to post. It has a body in the request. It doesn't have typically a body in the, in the response. Uh, submit data in the body to the server, but to typically update an existing resource. So in a traditional website with the get, you uh, get every page. With a post, you submit, for example, your login information, your username and password for creating a new account operation. With the put, typically you update your existing information. You don't create new things. You update something that already exists. You update a resource, typically. Notice also that get is called idempotent. That means that if I make a get request one time, two times, 1,000 times, the response is always the same. If I get a post request a first time, the second time the outcome of this post could be different. For example, if I perform a login, I use a post to perform a login. If I am logged in a website and I perform the lo post login, I'm already log in, logged in, so the response, the outcome of the operation is different from the previous because the, oper the first operation, the first post, allow me to log in in a website. The second operation probably give me error or something like, like you are already logged in. You cannot log in again. You are still logged in. Hmm? While the get, you can always perform a get operation and you should obtain always the same identical result. Um, the delete, delete instead a resource. Typically, it doesn't have a body in the request, neither in the uh, response. Uh, in the web, uh, is scarcely used. You can, typically, you don't want to delete an HTML page from, an, uh, from the website of another person. And then there are these other four that are more like debugging methods like trace the echo backs the request, you send a request and you see what is the rest, the, the final, how the request arrives to the server. But you see 
in, in your client. Options gives, gets a list of supported method from the server. Uh, connects, converts, uh, it's converts a HTTP connection to towards HTTPS, a secure connection. And patch is similar to put, but apply only partial modification to a resource, while put, it's me, put is for apply total modification, replace a resource at all, an entire resource, not only a portion of the total resource. Yeah, the, the initial line that is this one, here, this is the version of HTTP. I told you that this is the, the current version, the 1.1. It's used by the, we can say, 100% of the website in the world. There was a 1.0 version that now is practically not used. And there is a 2 version, not 2.0, only 2 version. Um, this one here that has been standardized in 2015-16. And uh, it, it's used by the, I don't know, something like 20% of the web server in the world. Um, and a web server can obviously support multiple versions. So a web server now could support HTTP 1.1 and the contemporary HTTP num number two, version two. This is the reason why you put here this indication, because you want to speak with this version of the protocol, not with another version of the protocol. In a response, you can have, a, uh, I show you the 200, okay, this 200 is a status code. You can have five family, we can say of status code. All of them is composed by three digits. So this is 100 and something, 200 and something, 300 and something, 400 and something, 500 and something. Here, there are four family. Everyone has a different meaning. The, the status code in the 100 are informational to provide you information. They don't give you uh, any hints about success, error, anything else, only information. The 200 are success codes. The request has been performed more or less correctly. The 300 are redirection codes. You encounter a redirection in Flask, when? You write somewhere with Professor Corno before Easter. Redirect, open parenthesis, uh, URL for home. Redirect to the home page. When do you redirect your page? In Flask. In? You will have, you, you realized a web application, yeah, right, more or less, yes or no, yes, that has two functionality, three pages, we can say, a home page, right, a login function, right, and a logout function, so in, in classroom. Then last Monday, two months ago, you also realize something more, a little bit more complex in, in, in Vladispe. But in that lecture, you have login and logout. That was to post. In one of the two, you use a redirect to the home page. Also think to your experience with a traditional website. When you log out or log in, you, have, you go on Facebook, you log in from the home page to the Facebook, and you go where? Yeah. To your home page, it is different from, and then when you log out, what happens? The main public home page. And you, this operation typically is a redirect, because you log out also in, the, in your application, in the application that you build in classroom, 
if you look at the three lines of code, two lines of code inside the logout method, one, the last one is, one is to clear the session and the other one was to redirect to the home page because you log out so you lose uh, the control of the logged in pages so you go on the public page. So this is a redirect and the browser send a 300 something status code in that case because you move tra from one page, this is the logout page, to automatically to the home page. Hmm? And then the other two families are for errors. The first one is the 400 and something are for client errors, and the other, the 500, is for server errors. You encounter this one, the, one of these several times, probably in your life. What message code you see several times, sometimes, in your life? 404, not found. This is a client error, because if the request if this, the resource exists on the server, the server is able to provide you. But it's your request that is wrong because you type something that is not valid. Let's try with that. For example, I know for sure that uh, if I, in GitHub, yeah. This is the page that is associated to the response 404. The, the, this is the web page you are not looking for that is not the, the official uh, translation, the 404 message code, but it's the 404. So when you type something here that is not valid, it does not exist on the server, it's a client error. <laughs> because the server is able to provide here, for example, um, Python web. Hopefully, yeah. So if it exists, the server is able to give you, to give you the, um, the right resource. If it's not existent, then it's your fault, not the server. So let's see some of these uh, status code, N not all of them. Hmm? So uh, here, for example, in the 200, you have OK. 200 is a status code for OK. That is what you hope to, to have for more, most of your um, navigation browsing the web. OK, the, rest, the request was successfully, this is your response. Great. The 201, for example, is when you uh, send a post. You post a new resource, so it's, it's OK, but also the resource has been created. So the login has been successfully successful, so probably it's a 201. <coughs> the 204, for example, is when the, resp the uh, get response return without content, for example. If it happens, could be no content. Mm -hmm. The 300 uh, here, for example, are the moved permanently and, and so on, are this redirect, 301, like the logout. Mm -hmm. Because you move from one page permanently to another page. And here you have the 404, not found, but you can also have, for example, the 401 unauthorized. You are trying to access a resource uh, that you have no authorization to look for. Or bad request. You are making a request that is not complete, not, uh, not, not complete, typically. Or forbidden, similarly. Uh, blocked by Windows parental control is Windows only. Um, and then, for example, you have the 500 internal server error that you will experiment several times during uh, the creation of your project. Because Flask, typically, when you made something wrong, or you have a bug, will reply 500 internal server error. And you have to, to understand with where is the error, which is the error. Hmm? So these are error from the server. The request is uh, correct. Is the server that before providing the response made some something, encounter a box or whatever, and is not able to provide a response, a correct response. And 501 not implemented is not a problem in their type, but maybe you call a function, you call an API that is not uh, entirely, a web page that is not entirely implemented in the server. It exists, but it cannot give you this page, this resource, because it's not yet implemented. It's like more a placeholder there. Hmm? 
and so on. But these, just to know that they exist, uh, and because some of them you will encounter, some of them in your uh, in realizing your project. Um, okay, these are some headers that are specifically <coughs> for request. We we don't you don't, don't have required to to learn all of them. We don't use it. Just to, just to have present that they exist. Typically, headers from a request and response are automatically set from the server, from the browser, or from your application. So you. In, only in some cases, in few cases, you need to add the specific request headers to the request of the response. In the request header, there are some of them. The only mandatory header that in fact is present in our example is host, that identifies the host name of the request, destination of the request. <coughs> Another request header that we'll encounter is this authorization that uh, it's useful when you want to uh, perform a request with an authorization. So for example, Twitter or Facebook uh, has the, some APIs, more or less REST, we will see. And But you need to be authorized to use this API to receive the response. So how you are authorized, you're authorized by login to, to the service or by asking for a code, a token to be used. This token is typically put here in this authorization header and so on. Similarly, we have a response header, none of them is mandatory, uh, and general header for request and response, like for example, date that we see before, or upgrade if you want to move from HTTP one to one, upgrade the, the, the protocol to uh, HTTP two, for example, you, will, you can use the upgrade header to indicate an upgrading protocol. The message body, I, I told you that could be present in the response or in the request. In the request contains when present the data entered by the user in a form, a file to upload, a JSON file to send, and so on. In the response contain the resource, the index.html page return to the client. And this body could contain images, uh, HTML file, plain file, a plain text file, a JSON file, and so on. The body has associated a content type that the proper name is internet media type. They are also known as MIME type that is composed by three parts, a type, a subtype, and some optional parameter. This content type is this one. This is the type text. Also, this is the type text. And this is the subtype that in the first case is plain, a texty, uh, a textual file, plain file, or in this case, in a, is an HTML file. This is the content, a response will have a content type in this way, and the body of that response will be a real HTML file. Uh, a response with this content type in the body, uh, uh, the body will be uh, a plain text instead. And they are standard. They are set in the header for request or response. Uh, Non-standard types or subtypes start with X minus. And vendor-specific subtypes start with these three words with a, with a dot, and with a dot. So for example, these are all use the content type. The first one is text plain, and it is a plain text. The body of this request or response that start with its content type is a plain text. Then we have, for example, HTML here. Then we can have image. The type is image, the subtype is PNG for a PNG. Image JPEG for a JPEG, and so on. Audio, audio basic, uh, basic wave audio, or MPEG to identify MP3 file. And then we have video, for example, or application. Application PDF to send in the body a PDF document. A application JavaScript to send a JavaScript file. VND PowerPoint when the body is a PowerPoint file. This is vendor specific because it's Microsoft, it's not generic, it's not standard. 
So we have a PowerPoint file. And for example, we have application JSON that is the content type to send a JSON text file. Uh, do you know why the JSON is not under text but is under application? Because we, we see that it is a text file, basically. Basically, it's a text file, so I would expect to have text JSON, not application JSON. Do you have any hints? Yeah. It has something to do with JavaScript because I told you that JSON is, you can say, related to JavaScript. And since JavaScript is in application, as type application, not text, even if it is text, when they standardized the content type, the MIME type of JSON, they decided to put here under application, not under text, because of this relationship of some types with JavaScript. Um, and these are the headers for the message bodies. They are present only when a body in the message is present. So for example, we have the content type here, but also the content language. That is the language in which I expected the, the content, or the date of expiration, or the last modified of the resource, and so on. Yes, then HTTP is also authentication, some sort of authentication, but typically authentication is performed at application level, not HTTP level, so we can just skip. This is not really important for us um, because we never probably make a hit request in this course. Uh, Okay, and here we have a distinction, a difference between get and post, hmm? because you can use also get. I told you that post has in the request a body, and you use the post method, the post verb, to submit the data from a client to a server. You can also submit the data with a get uh, request. Is, I can say in this way, is the evil, it's bad, it's totally bad, do not submit uh, data with a get, because, because if you submit data with a get, the data is encoded in the URI. So HTTP is something, and this is all the, co all the data that you submit. So if you submit a username and password here, in plain text, you will have your username and password. So this is not really clever. And this is one, one reason. The other reason is that the get request, I, like I told you before, should be idempotent. So they may be repeated without changing the state of the application. If I perform five get to didactica.polito.it in three minutes, I will have the same response, hopefully, from the, the web server. If I perform a post to login, and then I will perform another post to login, I am already logged in, so the, re the, the response is different. The state of the application changed. So while since uh, submitting data changed typically the state of the application, it's better to use a post instead of a get. HTTP, uh, it's used for web pages, websites, but they also use as transport for many resources and protocol that are different for HTML and different for web pages. And we have some protocol that board was born, were born in the years like SOAP or WebDAV and so on. And we can also send, uh, as we see in the content type, different resources, text, images, video, audio, and so on. We will not see any of this protocol, but to use HTTP as a transport layer, we need, uh, we can say, a share, some convention, a share way of representing this resource. Otherwise, every uh, web application, not website, in the world will behave different from any other. So we need some, we can say, standard for real or de facto. And one of these standard, one of these style that is widely used nowadays is the REST. REST is an architectural style 
REST stands for Representational State Transfer, is a style. It's not a programming language, it's not a data format, it's not a protocol, it's a style of software architecture for systems that are distributed, like web system, HTTP system, that was uh, invented by this uh, person in his PhD thesis. At the end of his PhD, it uh, proposed uh, the REST uh, architectural style. Is, uh, since it's a style, is language independent. You can use the REST uh, in Python, in Java, in C Sharp, in Rust, uh, in whatever. Uh, it's platform in independent. You don't care if it's, you are working with a server that is a Unix, a client that is a Mac, or a Windows, or whatever. And it's based on standard, runs on top of HTTP. And yes, it can be easy, easily used in presence of firewalls for the reason that we will see now. The core concept in REST is a resource. A resource, I, I already told, called something here before a resource. But here, a resource can be anything that has an identity, a document, an image, a service, today's weather in Milan, a collection of other resources, or not a working object, people. The resource is the conceptual mapping to an entity or a set of entity, and not necessarily the entity that corresponds to mapping to any particular point in time, that is. The resource is a source of specific information. A student is a resource. A computer is a resource. A webcam may be a resource. A web page may be a resource. And the resources are mapped with URL in a specific way. And client and server with the rest architecture site exchange representations of that resource. So a resource could be represented in HTML, a resource could be represented in JSON, a resource could be represented in PDF, separately or together. And you may ask for the HTML representation or the JSON representation or the PDF representation, but the resource is always the same. It's the representation, the content that is transferred that is different. And you operate any operation on the resource is done by means of four HTTP methods. That is why I told you everything about, something about HTTP now. And these four methods are get, post, put, and delete. These four methods. And we have two types of resource. A item, a single resource, or a collection. A collection represents a set, a list, a collection of singular items. A, the format in the URL is the name, slash name of a resource. So for example, if we imagine that the Polytechnico has a, a, a public API for giving the, um, the students, all the stu enrolled students here, here in the university, in JSON format, it could be represented the, co the students' collection, all the students of this university, could be HTTP, api.polito.it, slash students. This is the collection of students, or for example, the collection of courses. You get every single, for example, co courses taught at, taught at Polytechnico. An item, an element, instead is a single specific item with its property. And the format is the resource, the collection defined before, and the identifier. So for example, if I want all the details about the stu a specific students, I will have HTTP something slash students, that is the collection, slash the unique identifier of this collection. That in our case, for example, is the student ID. So something like S123456. Or for the courses, we want all the property of this course will have courses slash 01ZQP. So collection and single resource. 
collections must be nouns, not verb. So students, it's okay. Waders, I don't know, it's okay, maybe. Courses, it's okay. Universities, it's okay. Uh, devices, it's okay. Users, it's okay. Not verb. And collections are more items, or typically there are used plural names. Universities, students, and so on. And concrete names. Courses, not items, or university items, of things that happens in university. Specific name, concrete name. Courses, students, not person enrolled in university, and so on. The four methods, the four HTTP methods that I told you before, get, post, put, and delete, perform different operation if they are uh, related to a collection or a single resource, a single item. The get retrieve the representation of the resource in the HTTP response body. Similarly to what happens when you type an address in your web browser. You get the, the HTML representation in your web browser. Here you get the representation of the resource. If it's a collection, it's a list, a set of every items in the collection. If it's a single element, you get the property of that element. So you can use the get with the collection or the item. The post is only used with collection. You cannot use a post with a single item. And the post create a new resource, create a new items. If we perform a post to slash students, I, will, I want to create a new enrolled students and your first year students, probably. The put, instead, update an existing element. So get, retrieve, element or collection of element, post, create an element starting from its collection, put, update an existing element, and delete, you can imagine, delete, will, Delete, will delete, uh, okay. And so le let's make an example. We have this resource, that is a collection, and this other one, that is a single item, a collection of dogs with an identifier that in this case is numerical. It could be also a string, it's not, no matter. It must be unique inside that collection. So, for example, a get to docs, to HTTP something slash docs, list all the docs present in that collection. A get to this specific uh, docs, the docs with ID 1, 2, 3, 4, show the information about that specific dog. A post with a request body that contains the description of the dog to be created to the collection, create a new dog. While a post to a specific resource, a specific item, gives error. Which error? One of the HTTP code status. For example, 500 internal server error. A put on the resource is, we can say, allowed, on the collection is allowed, but is typically to be avoided. Because the put, uh, remind this, the put is used for update an entire resource. So if you update the entire collection of dog, you, can, you have to provide the list, the new list of entire, the entire new list of dogs. If you want to change the age of one dog, you have to provide the entire properties of the dogs. So this bulk update is typically to be avoided. And also the bulk delete of all dogs is typically to be avoided. It's safer not to perform bulk update and bulk delete. Instead, I put on this single item, if the item exists, update the information about the dog with ID 1234, and a delete on this single item, delete the dog with ID 1234. 
again the put should and they told and say should not must should update the entire resource because for updating a por uh, portion of that resource you should you should do use the patch HTTP method but in practice is acceptable to use the put to update a portion of a resource so if you use a put to replace the entire resource it's okay if you use the put to replace a portion it's okay just to be sure which uh, choice you you make in developing your rest server when it is the difference is that you have here 100 uh, elements properties of this dog you want to update only the age because the next year the, the dogs uh, will change the, the age uh, one years more uh, you have to pass to the server every single property of that dog because if you pass only the age and you replace the entire resource you will have that dog one two three four uh, have only the age it lose name race whatever so you can, the put is totally to replace entirely the resource. If you want to replace a portion of the resource, it's okay, but be careful and uh, support this explicitly in the documentation and in your REST server. Then you can also express a relationship with, these, uh, with the REST uh, architectural style in this way resource that is the collection identifier slash another resource hypothetically slash another identifier as best practice you should not uh, go more than two or three relationship typically if you go on more than two or three relationship is because your structure of the rest uh, uh, api is there is something wrong in the structure, in the design of your REST API. So for example, we can, uh, we can take all the students and then we can take a specific students from the Polytechnical and then we want the courses of that students, only his, not the courses of the entire Polytechnical, but only the courses of the, these students here. Or similarly, we can take this course and get then a list of every students enrolled in this course with their properties. ID, name, surname, uh, uh, degree, mark, final mark, final grade, and so on. The representation, again, are returning get, a sent, as in a response, a sent, in a request, in put and post. Different formats are possible, mainly in your web server, in your REST server, and the REST server that you encounter in the world, the, the two representation used are JSON. JSON is widely used. And you can also have something in XML. But you can also have SVG, images, JPEG, and something like that. The format, since multiple representation could be available, you must specify the format. In the request header, for example, it would accept application JSON. You would like to have a JSON as a bad in the response or as an URI extension so this is the URI before dot JSON to identify the JSON or as a request parameter so question mark format equal JSON it's preferred the first alternative is preferred so let's see I put here three four three four um, APIs Let, let's open the first one only because we don't want to spend here one year the, the github these are the githubs the github API with this you can interact with the github with the repository with information create a new repository by your application so if you for example here you have we can say the resource so for example, we can open the, um, the repository and see, for example, not this. Yeah. 
the repository. For, for example, here, if you want to list if you want to list uh, let me just try so let's see the repository if we want for example list the repository your repositories, because in GitHub, the reposit repositories are associated to a specific user. You don't have a repository for everybody. You have a, rep a user, an organization, that has some repository, always. So if you want to list the repository of a specific user, so you notice that here is the collection, users, the identifier of the user that is username, that is unique because it's used for logging in the system, and then another um, collection that are the repositories. Notice that they are not singular. This is also exploit a collection. And, and for example here, there is an, also an example of a response. In this case, GitHub give you a JSON response. So if you request uh, with the parameters written here, you have the ID of the, the repository, the owner, this is the ID, the, the username, the, the, the URL of the, of the picture, the URL of the user, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then also the repository, the name of the repository, the full name of the repository, the description, if this repository private is a fork or the URL of the repository, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and so on. These are a lot of content to describe a repository. So here it describes all the repositories of this user that is Octocad in this, in this JSON. And so on, for example, here you can list repositories, notice that they change to, to avoid confusion, the, the list of every public repository stored on GitHub, no matter who is the owner of the repository. And again, this is the response. You can also create, how do you create a repository? You create with a post, in a collection that is a repo, because you can only create a repository if you are logged in. So you don't specify a username here in this case, but with this user, it identified the logged in user, the authorized user, you. Because you also in the, in the web application, you cannot create a repository for another person. You can only create a repository for you. But here, if we skip this, that is for, we can say, authorization to scope, scope, we have a plural collection that is the repository, and so on. This is the input, and then here we have an example of the, the request. In this, in this way, in this case, it's a post, so we have a, a request body, and this is the request body. I want, would like to create a repository whose name is this, the description is this, the page is this, etc. and the response is this one. Notice the status, 201 created. I created a new repository, so it's not 200, okay, but it's 201, and so on. Every a REST, REST-like server act and it described in a similar way. If we open, just for, for an example, the, for example, the Twitter API, also Twitter has some REST API, for example, is it, this is, Here again, you have the queries, in this case, uh, the additional parameter, and there are some examples here, and so on. So every documentation is more or less structured in the same way. Here you have the resource, the post, the get, and so on, like before. And the post 
creates a new resource, the put update a new resource, and the get get retrieve that resource. Because they adhere to this REST architectural style. Then we have, for example, so Google Calendar API is similar, or Facebook is similar. Um, notice another thing here. You can also have a complex resource search if you want to search for something different, more advanced than single collection. But notice this here, this one dot one. Is typically you have uh, a domain or name that start with API or there is slash API, and then you have a version number of that API so that you can create the version number two or the version number 1.1 .1 and maintain for a certain amount of time the API for the version number one so that developers could uh, uh, slowly change the request for from the previous version of your API to the new, newer version of your API and so on. So this is a good practice to add uh, these errors. When you have errors, as I told before, use the HTTP status code, 500, 404, and so on. Then the authentication. Some of these um, um, server APIs require authentication. So for example, Twitter in the streaming API only requires an authorization that is the header on the request that is OAuth and has an OAuth customer key and comma and other OAuth something key and so on and so on. So a series of values inside the header that you get by re registering your, your application, we can say, on the, on the Twitter server. Amazon similarly used this uh, type of authorization of OS with this token and the token is given uh, developer get this token from the Amazon Web Service. Google API uses OAuth 2. And the authorization in OAuth 2 in every OAuth 2 is written this way, bearer and a token. And again, the token, a developer get the token from the provider of the API. So Google will give you this token to put in every request that you made. Hmm. So, some guidelines. Design with standards in mind, if you need. Create should return URI. Post should create, should return URI, not resources. Hmm. Use the right HTTP method, get, post, put, delete for the right action. Not, do not create a resource with get or with put. And if you want, you're using HTTP behind, so you can use the infrastructure proxying, caching, expires, and so on. These are a lot of guidelines that I we don't read here. Now, m most of them I already told you, like bias towards concrete names, dogs, not animals, hmm, for example, multiple format, uh, query parameter, um, include version in URI, version one, for example, version one, version two, and keep one version long enough for developer to migrate towards the other. Errors use the status code and accompany the status code with a message. You, are, you, you can use JSON so you can put a message that ex well explain what's the problem um, and so on. So here we have uh, some resources, duplicate. And if you don't have any question, I will stop for 10 minutes before starting with the rest use case in Python.